My name's Nat and welcome to Thursday's webinar. Every Thursday we do deep dives into neurodiversity or mental health related areas and we are going to be looking at the cultural significance of obsessive compulsive disorder representation in the media. Basically what that means is why when we think of a D do we only think of hand washing? That's not what it is. I actually got diagnosed with OCD four years ago and honestly it's horrible. I hate it. I do not have the cleaning OCD. I'm like a messy pig. I definitely don't have that tied. Honestly, I can't find a single representation of how my OCD affects me in the public domain. I'm not going to talk too much about my own experience because honestly, I find it extremely triggering. Warning for all of you today, if he does get triggered a little bit, it's okay to take a step back. Even though we're talking about media, it still can be a lot in places. While today we're not actually focusing on neurodiversity, because CD it is and it isn't. It is because ultimately neurodiversity is alternative ways of processing information. How our brain puts A and B together. It's not because it's not necessarily neurodevelopmental. It normally happens later on in life. It's one of those grey areas. Personally, I think it is because does it mean you have a different dive experience to give to the world around us? Here's me, neurodiverse champion. Like I said, I actually have OCD and I take medication for it every single day of my life. I've got loads of these men. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but medication doesn't get rid of OCD. It can help you manage it to a certain regards. But I would say the biggest thing you can do to support your OCD, obsessive thought, is by having positive media that you can relate to. If all we are seeing is people who are quote unquote meat freaks, we're gonna have a negative view of ourselves. I never tell people I've got OCD. Really. I'm always, I've got dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, always banging on about those ones. The reason is because it's really stigmatized, misunderstood. If I tell you I have it, you're gonna assume I have something. And if I don't live up to that expectation in your mind, you'll think that I'm making up or there's a bit of a disconnect it gets messy. I think there's a long journey to go through regarding this. Today, the whole team's here. Everyone that matters. We've got myself, we've got April, we've got Danny, we've got Jess and Opie. We do these webinars every week. The last one that we have edited and uploaded is the Do I Have Social Anxiety Disorder? As you can see, we have all of these. They are recorded. OCD and pop culture. What is pop culture? Pop means popular and culture means a collective knowledge. What do most of us know? If I say in the UK, oh, EastEnders, you don't even have to watch it to know what it is. If I say David Beckham, football, even if you don't watch football, there are some sort of cultural references that collectively we all know, and it's because they are popular in the mainstream. A quick acknowledgement, I normally get my images from all over the place. However, I found this really great article in the New Yorker called OCD on and off the screen. The little illustrations were so good, I used all of them. I don't know how you go about getting these permissions. However, publicly if they I'm using these images and thanks a lot by Philip and Jason. Essentially their story is really interesting. They both have OCD. One of them one day was overly honest online and said about their experiences. And the other one was that sounds just like me. Why don't we make a comic and illustrations or collaborate to depict what OCD is? That's why I use a lot of their images throughout. It's a nice article, it's just comic books to be honest, but I found it very relatable. Why are we doing OCD in film and TV? Media representation is important. We spend the majority of our lives teaching and training people about how the brain works. Not because this knowledge isn't already in the public domain, but because of fake news is ranking higher in our subconscious. When we think of ADHD, we think of oh, squirrel attention. When we think of dyslexia, we think of can't spell all right. When we think of autism, we think of someone who can't make eye contact. These are stereotypes. They aren't true. TV perpetuates it which means they push that narrative forward. If we understand how the media manipulates our brain, we might be able to correct it so we don't fall into that trap of thinking that we're all carbon copies of each other. With this overly long idea, let's look into how it's represented in film and TV. My first question to all of you is what misconceptions about OC do you think are most persistent in society? While you do that, here's one of these lovely little images for our full house. 
He is vacuuming a vacuum cleaner, which is ridiculous, but it's meant to get a cheap laugh. And that is one of the main pitfalls of TV. My pain and suffering is your little giggle. This same thing was also depicted in Friends with Monica, who also vacuumed a vacuum cleaner. Going back a hundred times to check a locked door. Yep. But it's just a bit one-dimensional, isn't it? I'm not saying that's not for some people, because they're easy. It's true, cheap lasts. You're going to get a quick chuckle out of it. Distraction is OCD. Pencils all in a row, classic one. Uh, you saw my desk right now, it's K. The Aviator, which I will talk about, April mentioned how that person is the real life person of those CD. They are real life, but also they had a film about them. The film, I would say, is a caricature of them, hence not a real person. Good point. We've got doing the same thing over and over again. Yep, that is what people think it is. All labels on the can in the cupboard, the same way around. Yeah, classic one. There are lots of different types and some are more easily to visibly represent. Yeah, absolutely. Not only you put the cleaning one, that tends to be like the number one go-to when people think of it. Doing this thing, same and same again. I suppose it's reason because let's say you work in a supermarket and you're doing the same thing time and time again. That's normal because that's your job. What about every single day you get up and brush your teeth? That's normal. But if you're doing something excessively, like washing your hands until they start bleeding, thinking about something which has no right to be in your mind and repeating over and over again, it's any sort of repetition which can cause distress if that kind of circuit completed. Now let's just look at some quick stats and facts. So first of all, apparently OCD is the fourth most common mental disorder. This is a big one. It should be noted that OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder, where a lot of people might just have those obsessive disorder tendencies. So you don't have to be diagnosed to still experience it in a negative way. With most mental health conditions, they're only really a disorder when they start acting severely negatively for a long period of time in your day-to-day -day life. My quick question to all of you is, what do you reckon is the percentage of those in the UK who have OCD? I did the UK in particular because the US actually has higher rates of OCD. That could be a number of factors, to be honest. I believe 3% is what it is in the US. But again, this could be due to the amount of people who are diagnosing. It could be for a number of factors. But in the UK, it is 1.2%. That might not sound like a lot, but that is about 800,000 million people. I've got the next stat on the next screen, but that is a lot of people. The one thing people get confused is everyone thinks OCD is cut and dry. It's having obsessive compulsive thoughts. No, because you could have just obsessive thoughts. You could have just compulsive thoughts. You could have a combination of those. Or you could have co-occurrence. You might also have social phobias, like struggle to go outdoors. Uh, Tourette's or ticks are very common to go with it. Alcohol abuse, gambling is also really common. Or you might be addicted to the internet, addicted to video games, even sexual disorders. And we are going to be talking about that one later because there's a really good representation called Pure, which was created by Charles Forably, which showed sexual disorder OCD. There are many different ways it can manifest, but typically it's not a standalone. Others come along for the ride or OCD comes along with them. On this screen, I want you to rank your biggest misconceptions about OCD. Which of these do you think most people believe? If you think most people believe it, number one. If you think some people, but not everyone, do it down to a number four. We got OCD affects few people. It's not that common. Is it true? Is it not? We know it's not. Loads of people have OCD. OCD can be cured with treatment. No, you can't treat it with most things with mental health conditions. It's not about curing, it's about managing and learning to work with it rather than against it. OCD is only about cleanliness. Absolutely 100% not true. The type of areas it could affect is potentially absolutely endless. From health OCD, to germ OCD, cleanliness OCD, order, patterns, routine, it really is endless. Is there already a OCD recording on the YouTube channel. We have done other ones on OCD, but we've never done a pop culture one on it. OCD is an area which we're doing a little bit more about recently. OCD involves both obsession and compulsion. A lot of people think that it is literally one, it's both. You could have pure OCD, which is predominantly obsessive thoughts. Sometimes it can manifest in multiple ways. Interestingly, in women, it can look quite different to males. From anorexia, bulimia, hair is quite a big one, to be honest. 
skin picking, compulsive buying, you can start to see how broad it is. When we start showing you the representations of media, you're going to see one thing and one thing cropping up time and time again. OCD, we've got about 150 people, but honestly, this is quite an old stat. I found a more recent one, which is looking at about 100,000-ish at the moment, so a large amount of people. Unfortunately, people still think it is just around cleanliness and perfectionism. That's quite an interesting stat. 90% of OCD patients were also diagnosed with another disorder. Then you ask, now, why are we doing OCD if you talk about neurodiversity? They go together. A lot of people who are neurodivergent also have OCD. The reason why? Maybe that's for another day. Brenda, you just asked for the slides. We record all these sessions, so you can absolutely get the recording for this might be more useful than the slides, but you're also welcome to have the slides if you drop me an email. Is it really a disorder or a condition? Do you tell me the definition? This, this, as in different from the ordinary. Do you think differently from the ordinary? Disorder, a condition, is just like you have. I would say they mean the same thing, to be honest. It's more about the connotations. You see, see, possible. I don't know. Officially, it's a disorder, but I, I get where you're coming from. See, let's look why we're all here for today. Some media portrayal. That's what I want to look at is the odd couples. I don't know. Danny, maybe you've watched this. It was a long time ago. But do you think? No? Okay. This was your stereotypical Drake and Josh, Keening and Kel, two polar opposites, worlds collide, a neat freak and a messy slob. What possibly could go wrong? This was looking at the both extreme ends of the spectrum. Again, played for laughs, but... One of the earliest examples that I was familiar with. I want you to name a character that you believe depicts a trait. Either because they say, hi, I have OCD. Or it's quite obvious. Or you see a bit of OCD within their personality. One example is Matchstick Man, which is Nicolas Cage. And he has a really interesting rare comorbidity of OCD and heist. Bank robber. Quite rare, may I say. But interesting nevertheless. You've also got potentially Hannibal from the Hannibal Silence of the Lambs. But we're talking about the prequels with Mad Madison, the guy who played the younger version of him. Before you say, are we saying that psychopath? No. But that series is about his journey into being a psychopathic killer. And he shows a lot of kind of traits throughout the series. Poppy from Wild Child. Yep. Howard Hughes. Unsocial males. I'll think that. Nerd males, American Psycho. Yeah, I could see that from there. Especially when they were the, how pristine they are with the neatness and the cards and the dedication. Ray from Uptown Girl. Monica for Fred. Bob from What About Bob. Yes, Sheldon Cooper. Well, it's great to see a lot of you have got ones that I mentioned as we go out, but also a few that I haven't. I think you can, we can all agree that a lot of these, to simply say they have OCD wouldn't be accurate because none of them are pure OCD. They all have other things going on. Be it a psychopath, being potentially autism, all of these have other things under the hood. It's okay for things not to be pure because people aren't. 90% of people with OCD also have something else. It makes everything else in life more difficult, but on its own, it is one of those things like a, a plus one that you wish didn't come along to the party with you. It really can be debilitating. And I think that the media often really underplays how impactful it can be on people. Have you heard of any of these characters? I know some of you mentioned, some of you didn't. Have any of you heard of Adrian Monk from Monk? His show is ridiculous. The literal tagline is OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Detective. It's so bad, it's good. It's not bad, but obviously they do go over the top. Then we've got Melvin from As Good As It Gets, which is an amazing film. A little bit on the extreme side, but some good representation sprinkled throughout. He is the poster child of OCD. Whenever I think of OCD, I always think of Melvin. Sheldon Cooper, not officially diagnosed with OCD in the series, but he definitely has a lot of those qualities. You also hear him often say, doesn't he also have autism? Again, not officially, but part of autism is repetition, and repetition is part of OCD. You can see how they all link in. Then we've got Matchstick Men, Roy Walker. His one kind of manifests in quite an explosive, angry way sometimes. Emma from Glee. I'm not imagining most of you know who that is, but I used to love Glee back in the day. She is 
a little bit ditzy. She's very stereotypical, cleanly. She even cleans her grapes before eating them. Then we got Howard Chu in the aviator. This one's an interesting one because that's actually based on a true story. But of course, they will take some creative liberties as well. But let's have a quick look at Monk. Monk is the OCD detective and he does a lot of... Actually, let's just look at Monk first because those are two separate things. He's an adorable quirk, helps him solve mysteries. But they are playing the fact that, hey... I know I'm a bit different, but I'm going to use that different as an advantage. That's very much neurodiversity, turning upside down upwards, turning a negative into a positive. However, they do rely on his workiness in order to be the sense of humor. On the other side, we've got as good as it gets. Let's look at some stereotypical. By stereotypical, we just mean they are the thing that we see time and time again. When you think of something, what's the first thought that pops into your head? We talked about characters like Adrian Monk. It's not a bad series, but again, none of these are great representation. Sheldon Cooper, which is probably the most well-known one these days. And Melvin, who reinforces OCD stereotypes by focusing on cleanliness and organization. Already, I would argue the three most popular stereotypes related to cleanliness and order. When we were looking originally about all the co-occurrence on how it can affect you, there was so many. Where are these perfect representations on how my mind works? We're going to go into a bit more of a deeper dive. Opie says, never sure if Monk was OCD before he lost his wife and if it's just a coping mechanism as of seeking a psychologist to get his job back. Yes, Opie, you're right. He did lose his wife and then that did trigger the OCD. Remember, OCD isn't a neurodevelopmental condition like autism, which is with you through life. OCD is something that can develop. Quite often, it goes hand in hand with post-traumatic stress disorder. He probably didn't have it. He may have been more likely to have it due to genetics, but it's genetics and environmental, which ultimately determines whether or not how something affects someone. We're actually talking about as good as it gets. This poster child, most people might have seen. You might have seen a DVD in CX or something. It's Jack Nicholson holding a dog up and he's smiling. That's as good as it gets. What you a lot of people don't realise is, look more closely at this image next time. He's holding gloves. He will not pick up the dog without gloves. There is a barrier to his enjoyment. Throughout the film, he does make progress. They get to a certain point where he hit the brick wall and he's not progressing any further. He says, is this as good as it gets? The title is actually a little bit of a kicker. It really hits home that while we can manage it, we do not cure it. In that regards, I don't think as good as it gets is particularly an overly bad representation. It does show him as a bit more of a feistier character than I'd say most people with OCD. Again, OCD is very individual. Is as good as it gets, if you've seen it, a good representation or a bad representation of OCD? If you haven't seen it, don't worry. A lot of things, well, I say a lot, one person thinks it is a successful representation. I'm guessing the rest of you haven't seen it. I recommend watching it. The next one is Scrubs. None of you mentioned Scrubs. While not a major character, have any of you seen it when Michael J. Fox was in it as Dr. Kevin? Dr. Kevin was a phenomenal doctor. I really liked him because he was really talented. However, his OCD was quite limiting. But you could argue that because he was very much played for laugh, he was a bad representation. And I would probably say, that aside, there was a lot of good in his character. Because he didn't just show OCD for one-liners, move on. They showed him throughout a series, for instance, hours after having an operation, he would still be cleaning his hat. Genuinely, I love Scrubs. It's an interesting Scrubs, I think, was very ahead of its time. We mentioned Sheldon Co Big Bang Theory never officially said he had OCD, but I think we all know he definitely did. Everyone who's watched Big Bang Theory knows a penny, 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 and it's a running joke. He's always knocking on the door. I think later on, I believe we find out because he walked in on his mum having sexual relations, I think how the story went, that was like the origin or the traumatic event which gave birth to his OCD tendencies. OCD is definitely something that can develop over time. And I think originally this was just a one-line gag, but as the series went on, they did flesh out the backstory, which gave it a little bit more depth. On the whole, I think Big Bang Theory is terrible. <laughs> and I say that because it's just rife with stereotypes. It pushed stereotypes along long after a lot of them have went long out of date. However, lots of people widely love it. But there are positives that can be taken from it. Personally, I think Young Sheldon was a much more progressive show. They showed much more three-dimensional characters and it felt more like a drama than the standard 
ha ha comedy. I want to ask your opinion because I'm sure if you've not watched Big Bang Theory, you probably will at least be aware of. We've got Shelter's behavior accurately reflects OCD symptoms. How accurate is it? Yeah? No? In the middle? The show perpetuates stereotypes about OCD. So what we think OCD is, does it keep pushing that narrative forward? Or is it changing the curve a little bit and mixing it up? Sheldon's character helped raise awareness about OCD. Ultimately, is it beneficial to people's overall understanding of it? The portrayal of OCD in the show is exaggerated for comic effect. Are we up in it? The ante? For a cheap laugh? Viewers can learn about the challenges of living OCD from Sheldon. That's quite negative, I would say, is done for laugh. Overall, I'm getting the feeling that more or less it's overly negative. You could say there's no such thing as bad publicity. But I would say there definitely is when you're talking about mental health conditions. Penny, it's a joke. I wanted to see a little bit more from him. I appreciate it's a comedy though. We've just got to find the right balance between laugh but also not damaging society overall. Tom wonders if has not seen these movies if one is missing out on something. I would say to Tom, I don't think you need to watch them all. Watching everything is going to take forever. If you have OCD, it can be useful in some regards. But the best ones I leave to laugh. I'm showing you all the dodgy ones first. I don't think you're necessarily missing out. Here's some quick highlights from Big Bang. Why I think not amazing in terms of how they represent OCD. It focuses on compulsivity. Uses OCD-like behavior for humor. They're focusing on one element of it. They're not showing the whole way it impacts someone. It's overshadowing of obsessions. While it focuses on the compulsion physical act of having to do something i am compulsed to do it the internal obsession is very much put to the wayside ignores the distresses of the intrusive thoughts i want to know what's going on in sheldon's head i see that he physically is not able to do something but mentally what is the internal struggle that he's having to overcome it's a little trivializing which means it underplays it it's just a joke it doesn't really show you the long-term impact that it can have on your psyche. It does promote misunderstanding because when I think of OCD, I just think it was a bit quirky. It's someone tapping the door multiple times or having a favorite seat. It really hinders people coming forward to talk about it. Why would I tell you I have OCD if the only idea you have of it is based on a character who is just a cheap laugh? You're just setting yourself up for bullying. When it comes to how we portrayal, there is limitations on the usefulness of them. The media often highlights the compulsion for comedy and, as I said, overshadows the obsession. You've got a difference between how it physically manifests to how it internally affects you. We never really see the internal struggles. It also promotes misunderstanding. You've got to ask yourself, is it better to not have it represented at all or to have it represented but in a very flat, one-way negative perspective? You tell me. Gregory says, it more than anything represents the person as being insufferable to others. Yes, Gregory, I think that's spot on, particularly with Sheldon. He is unsufferable. That's why a lot of people can't stand him, which we know you, know, you can be amazing in OCD. It can affect people in many different ways. I want you here to select all the ones which you have noticed when watching the media. When I say media, we know books, radio, TV, film, any sort of thing that is screamed to the masses. We've got excessive cleanliness and ugliness. Have you seen that portrayed? Compulsive focus, being super dedicated. Humorous quirks, your standard British quirky gentleman. A high functioning and eccentric genius. A lot of people with OCD are portrayed as geniuses, which is interesting. I think people assume that if you're smart, you have to automatically have some sort of social deficit. And predictable and saniness. Is it a character which you are very, you know what they're going to do? It's no surprise to any of us. A lot of you are going for the cleanliness one and the genius. I would say if you look at most of the examples, be it Sheldon, even Melvin from As Good As It Gets, I would say they actually fit most of these ones, to be honest. All very predictable, all quite funny, very compulsion rather than obsessive focused. A good example of someone who I believe has all of these traits is Monica Geller from Friends. Monica is an absolute cleaner holic. One quote is, it's not just clean, it's Monica clean. She very much likes order and stability. I'm sure there's going to be some friends on Monica out there. No, she's the best, but I would say she's probably the most damaging out of them. But again, prove me wrong if you think otherwise. Here is a real line from her. She says, once there was a dirty car in front of the building, so I washed it. That's not funny. 
But you can see that they use laugh track on the back of Friends. If you don't think it's funny, the audience or the canned laughter is telling you it's funny. You start to think that it's funny. You get manipulated into thinking, trivializing and one-dimensionalizing, if that is a real word, certain characteristics is a big old joke. We've got a click excessive cleanliness when she's vacuuming the vacuum. Again, focusing on the compulsion, not on the obsession. We've got very competent, so maybe not a genius, but very competent, very funny. I can't think of one example in Friends, admittedly it's been a while since I've watched it all, where they have a heart to heart and they talk to Monica about it. It's always a joke. And I think it's okay to have a joke about things. I'm not going to shut people down for making some jokes, but you do have to balance it in order for something to seem real. Tick on all of those negative boxes. Let's dive deeper into the impact of misrepresentation. What actually happens if we are consistently showing negative, inaccurate view of obsessive compulsive disorder over a long period of time? You tell me, first of all, what do you think are the long-term negative effects of stereotypes? Are there any that you have personally experienced? They don't have to just be related to OCD. Maybe it could be due to autism, dyslexia, OCD, Tourette's. Any sort of thing that you've noticed over a long time had been damaging. This can affect gender, race. Essentially, every protected characteristic is a victim to negative stereotypes. I suppose you could also have positive stereotypes, but that's not always a good thing. For instance, all Asians are great at math. Stereotype sounds positive, but it's not because it puts unrealistic expectations on individuals. All autistic people have amazing superpowers. No, they don't. Again, that puts a lot of pressure on people. Positive and negative, ultimately, I think, are negative overall. We've got shame. Yep, the shame of talking about it. People become dumb and start thinking about things deeply. Yeah, if someone says you've got OCD, I don't need to think more deeply and ask more probing questions to understand you better. I've got all the information I need. You clearly like cleaning. There are either just obsessive traits or compulsive ones, but not a mixture of the two. Yeah, exactly. People say OCD. Oh, I've got a little bit of OCD. Doesn't work like that. You don't need to have just a little bit of that or a sprinkle of pepper, a little bit of salt. You have it or you don't. You can have traits, you can have characteristics, but you shouldn't minimalize it. So stereotypes that you have to be physically compulsive to suffer with OCD. So if you say you have OCD, people don't believe you. Yeah, people believing you is a big one as well. If I do tell people I have it, they say, you don't have that, Nat. Then making a joke at the fact that I'm really messy. I guess I don't have it then, even though I struggle every single day of my life. It underplays it. It's hard to disprove once it's in people's heads. Yep, mud sticks. Puts people in boxes. People question you more if you don't fall under the common trait. Absolutely. Oh, yep. Ronnie, this is being recorded. So you can catch up on our YouTube channel. Let's look a little bit more at Emma from Glee. Again, I don't imagine a lot of you have seen it. But Glee's a great show. Or at least it was. Emma, who is the school counsellor, not the best counsellor. She talks to the students about their problems. She is your very quintessential, quiet, obedient, soft-spoken woman. And she says, I had to clean the grapes. When I get stressed out, cleaning it is the only thing that calms me down. Okay, while this is a little bit over the top, I do like the fact that it gives the explanation. She's not saying she affects me consistently. It's saying when I'm stressed, when there is a trigger, that is heightened it. OCD, when you complete that compulsive cycle, the reason you do it is because it calms you down. But because it calms you down, the brain gets a boost of doing And the brain says, I like that. We should do that again. You end up cleaning grapes all the time, even though you don't need to. There's something deeply satisfying because you can't really explain it, but she knows it's satisfying. That's quite accurate about getting every nook and cranny, even the ones you can't see. It goes beyond physically needing to do something like, oh, I've got mud on my hand, to seeing your hands are completely clean, but mentally you think there's things that are beyond your eyesight that you have to really get to. It's like being able to control something. That is a feeling I personally really resonate with. Obsessive compulsive disorder is about having a lack of control. It's when your body owns you and you don't have a say in the matter. If there is something you're able to do which can ease the symptoms, even temporarily, and it gives you a tiny bit of respite, it gives you that sense of ownership and control. I get the compulsions, but it's when we let those compulsions dictate our everyday life is when we've got to reel it back in. Glee, ups and downs in terms of the overall thing, but this particular quote, I think it actually said quite a lot. In terms of the negative side effects of Emma from Glee, 
it reduces empathy. Emma's OCD is used for humour. It is just trying to show how trivial her things are. Like, get over it, Emma. It's the grape. It deters help by making it seem so, why would anyone get support for it? It's not important. It's nothing. It's misunderstanding. It, once again, focuses on cleanliness, overlooking on deeper issues. She's a run-of-the-mill stereotype on that perspective, and it stigmatizes the condition. But while I can get positive, and let's face it, when you watch media and you aren't represented on TV or film, you will look for yourself in every little nook and cranny of pop culture to find a little piece of you. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the best thing out there. Some other negative ideas and stereotypes is the representation and how it stops people from getting help. If we're looking at the widest sphere, we've got a car and their advertising storage and their slogan is treat your OCD, which is get organized, get your life together, which is really trivializing it. Then there's a t-shirt, which I believe was being sold in Walmart and it was OCD, obsessive Christmas disorder. A woman posted it online and she got loads of hate for it. Because snowflake, don't like a joke. Boo. Of course that's not okay. A joke has to be funny. If it's not funny, it's not really a joke. I would say something which is so public is very distasteful. But again, you tell me if you think, where is that line? An example of someone who has OCD, who played a character with OCD, who was based on a real person with OCD, it's Leonardo DiCaprio. He says, I remember my makeup artist and assistant walking me to the set of The Aviator and going, Oh, we're going to need 10 minutes to get in there because he has to walk back and step on that thing, touch the door, walk in and out again. It shows the ritual behavior. And on one hand, this was already there beforehand and it helped him play the character to I think, a quite good level. It's a good film, but you could probably say it made him worse, got him overly focused on it. Which of these celebrities did you know had OCD traits. Some of these are like official OCD and others are ones that have just really said that they have. We've got Shui Mandel, David Beckham, football, Leonardo DiCaprio, actor, Jessica Elba, actress, Cameron Diaz, actress, Megan Fox, actress, Justin Timberlake, all-round superstar, Martin Scorsese, director, Alec Baldwin, comedian slash criminal, I guess, Donald Trump, president-ish. As you can see, all of these have OCD and I bet maybe you didn't know about them. Some of them are very outspoken about it. There's really interesting examples. Shui, I, I think let's actually go in about how they affect people. Interestingly, the rest didn't know about the others. Yeah, the Trump does publicly speak about it. He's very much with having clean hands. Very stereotypical, but it's a real example. Let's have a look at them. Shui struggles with fear of jail. David Beckham, need for order and symmetry. He has done a few little docs on that, and it's really interesting how it affects him. It's been, he talks about how it has gotten worse the longer he's been around. Leonardo DiCaprio is very much repetitive, uh, ritualistic behavior, which is quite interesting because a lot of his characters from Wolf of Wall Street to, oh, the one where he went into a bear, or was it a horse? I can't remember. But a lot of his characters show that same personality trait. Jessica Alba is very organized. Whether or not someone has a D or just obsessive compulsive trait, that has to be investigated a little bit more thoroughly. Cameron Diaz, hand washing. Megan Fox, Jeremy the Game. Justin Timberlake. Need for specific arrangement. Things have to be done in their order. Alec Baldwin, cleanliness. Donald Trump, need for order and cleanliness. Morton Scorsese, repetitive routine. But you could probably see how some of these traits, like Mark Scorsese, Donald Trump, could actually be beneficial to their career, where some of them are just all round not very helpful. But I do find it interesting. I will say, though, a lot of these fall to our pre preconceived ideas of what OCD is. They are celebrities, right? Celebrities are okay, but they're not real people in the sense that they're relatable. A great example of a real person is Elizabeth, who is the founder of Peace of Mind. I believe it's an American charity, but it seems like a great organization. They talk about OCD from a first-hand perspective. They talk about it not just from the cleanliness perspective, but from how it affects people in many different ways. The CEO talks about their own personal life experience, not too dissimilar to exceptional individuals. But it's also very advocacy-based. Rather than just talking about it, they try to get support and to do things for a benefit. This brings me on to this question. How should we be depicting it? Should it be fictional because that way we can create a character which we could all relate to? Should it be inspired by real events but ultimately still acted out? Should it be a documentary when we're filming other people and saying we can edit it 
Or should it be autobiographical where the other person is selfie style and talking? So far we've got autobiographical. I don't know if there's really a right way or wrong way of doing it, but I would say the best practice is having experts, both lived experience and academic experience, working in order to make sure that representation is as accurate as possibly can be. There's nothing necessarily wrong with fictionalized work, but do know that you have a much bigger responsibility than you realize. Quite realistically, that might be a child's first exposure to obsessive compulsive disorder. If the first exposure they have is one dimensional and negative, that is only going to grow the older they get because they're going to be looking out for what they believe are the only traits associated. Real stories from individuals can help provide a nuanced understanding. It can show you how diverse and broad it is. It can also challenge some of the ideas that we've already created. In terms of the future on how we could progress and move forward, it's showing it. These cartoons are great. Phil used to swallow at every traffic light it hurt, but if he didn't, some terrible danger could put him in two words that would hurt him and his family. You can see that swallowing, that can be obsessive compulsive disorder, but it's not something we normally think about. And it also shows you the person's justification. Because you can make an easy joke of the fact that he swallows all the time. But when you understand the backstory, not so funny. One of my favourite representations of obsessive compulsive disorder is pure. It never got a second series, I believe. But it was a Channel 4 um, short theory, and it was called Pure because there's a pure OCD, which is purely obsessional OCD. It for Maria, who highlights the struggles with intrusive thought, and it portrays her understanding of managing. Hers was quite an interesting one, where essentially everything was sexualized, and that might seem like that's funny, but this show, while it acknowledges that, haha, that could be funny, it really shows the intrusive side of it. So it doesn't just show the external side, this is all about her world, how she experienced it, and how traumatic it can be. If you're looking for a good representation, definitely check out this series, which I believe is on all four. My last question I'm going to ask to you is, what do you think the media can do to better improve representation of conditions like OCD? Is there anything which you would love to see going forward? Are there things that you can do at home? It's easy to look at bad examples. There was no shortage of them. But how do we move forward? How do we get more examples like Pure or even better examples? Avoiding the stereotypes, show real people in life situations, show them in different forms, not just widely known types, show more complex characters instead of one dimensional. You don't have to show one thing. People have lots of different angles to them. I've got to show you one more example. This is a really good one. If any of you have seen the series Girls, which is awesome by the way, I got totally addicted to it. It got Adam Driver in, who was Kylo Ren, but more importantly, the person who created it had OCD. Also, the character has OCD talks about Hannah, but it's gruesome to be honest. In the episode, it's back, she shows a nuanced portrayal of the horror and absurdity of OCD. Our protagonist Hannah, about her perfection of counting in symmetry, she cleans her ear so much that she bursts an eardrum, which is like she then does the other ear, even after bursting it, because she has to have it balanced to symmetry. I'm not going to play the video because it's actually quite disturbing, but shows you the real horror that OCD can manifest into. The Aviator is another good example. We talked about uh, DiCaprio and that's because it was heavily researched. It was based on a real life story so it did have the nuances which we look and crave for and I think because DiCaprio had first-hand experience with OCD it also made it quite interesting. They said, regarding representation in media, there's also John Green. I love John Green. He's just done a video recently on how he's really struggling with his mental health at the moment. So he's taking a month break. He wrote about the book Tools All The Way Down, which is about a girl with OCD that I believe they've recently made into a film. Yes, they did. I haven't watched it, but yeah, John Green is a really great role model, I believe, for everyone. Going forward, combating stereotypes requiring a combination between writers, directors and advocates. We need authentic narratives and complexities. We need to move past just being a germaphobe or a little bit kooky to someone who has ups and downs and it shows the whole breadth of what it's like having something like OCD. If you learned anything today, it's that the media is powerful. It has control over our subconscious and how we perceive things. It's important that we expose ourselves to a broad range of depictions of condition for us to truly understand it and have a better set of empathy. I'm not against comedy. I love comedy, but it's about that balanced approach because people only know 
what they know. So you have to show them a wide range. I do think it's so important that we understand what is real and what is fiction, what is a blend of both worlds. Just to end with, if any of you do have OCD, whether it's just obsessive compulsive traits or an actual disorder that you've been diagnosed with, you can get support in the workplace and that's what we do. When I'm not talking about TV, we're helping people in the workplace. But you can just go on our website and get support. For the next webinar, I'm loving the pop culture at the moment, Tourette's. Tourette's has been said as the physical manifestation of OCD. It focuses much more on the physical act of the compulsion in your head. Tourette's, we know, is highly stigmatized. Twitching, swearing, well, we know it's way more than that. How is Tourette's being depicted in the media? And how can it be predicted in a positive way? And how should it be? Yes, do check it out. And you can go on our YouTube channel if you like. Hey, now I want to see this again. You can click subscribe. Groundbreaking news. 6,000 subscribers. Might not sound a lot to you, but it took us years. We're very happy with that. Mega shout out to April for that one. If you want to contact us, you can contact us. Thank you everyone so, so much for your attendance today. It's been really fascinating. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into a really interesting subject and keep the discussion going. But hopefully see you all next week. Have a great Thursday.